The truth about the Trayvon Martin case is that an innocent teenager was shot to death and his shooter is walking free today. There's even one report that suggests the lead investigator recommended that George Zimmerman be charged on the night of the incident. But others have gone down a different path, choosing to blame the victim, reaching for the most redundant black stereotypes in the process. When it emerged that Trayvon was under suspension when he was shot, Glenn Beck's The Blaze offered almost 50 crimes that could have warranted the punishment, including sexual battery, homicide and, without any irony, a hate crime. And then there's Fox News contributor Keith Ablo, disgusted with the president's remarks that if he had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. Look, if the president had a son, he wouldn't look anything like Trayvon Martin. He'd be uh, wearing a blazer from his prep school. Uh, he'd be driving a Beamer uh, and he'd be surrounded by Secret Service for that matter. The difference for Ablo, I suppose, is that Obama's son would look safe. Back with us, Karen Finney, Joanne Reed, and Steve Konaki. Joanne, you are reporting some new developments on this case. What are they? Well, um, what we've learned since we've been down here is that the decision not to charge George Zimmerman um, was not made by the police department. It was actually made by the state attorney's office, but not the office, the actual state attorney. What we learned is that the state attorney who's in charge of this county, uh, Mr. Wolfinger, actually came to the scene or to the police station the night of the shooting and in consultation with the police chief and the head of investigations, overruled the lead investigator, the lead homicide investigator in the case, and said that there was not enough information to charge Zimmerman and therefore they cut him loose. We do know they did some other things. They did some forensic examination. They actually took Zimmerman back to the scene to do a, a, a reenactment of what happened, but they ultimately let him go, and that now is at the doorstep of the state attorney. But they didn't take his clothes? They didn't examine them for signs of blood or any kind of injury, did they? Well, now that's in question. The Orlando Sentinel here has reported that, in fact, they did take Zimmerman's clothing, that they did take them for later examination. Um, but I think what's also significant here, in addition to the fact that they apparently did take his gun as well, so that's the misinformation that's been out there. But what's significant is that the state attorney, Mr. Wolfinger, initially took the case. When police cycled it up to his office, he didn't refuse to take it, despite apparently having made the call to let Zimmerman go. He ultimately recused himself, but now there's a question of whether, had he kept it, would there have been a thorough investigation? Would that grand jury have resulted in an indictment? Now, of course, it's out of his hands. He's recused himself, and Angela Corey has been appointed um, to actually take care of this case now at the state level. Right. Karen, aren't some sections of the media attempting in death to mischaracterize this young man's personality, as George Zimmerman appeared to do so in his life when he assumed that Trayvon Martin was a troublemaker and a delinquent? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, ironically, I suppose, people want that to fit the narrative, right? In the same way that Zimmerman saw this young man in this community and something in his head said, that seems out of place to me. Uh, folks uh, online and trying to revert to a lot of the same stereotypes. Uh, and the interesting thing, you know, Martin, is they're accusing sort of us uh, of jumping to conclusions rather than sort of listening to the, the facts. I mean, on the tapes, it's very clear that George Zimmerman had s some kind of stereotype in his mind that suggested that this young man was out of place. And, you know, the problem we have, I think there's two pieces to this, really, and I think Joanne really gets at it. On the one hand, there's what was going on with George Zimmerman and what really happened. And as, it, as it, what's emerging is, then there's this second piece in terms of how the police handled it, this legal case, and, and you know whether or not there are more instances in which there was police misconduct. Indeed. Joanne, there are reports that a now defunct Twitter account is that of Trayvon's. His lawyer says that's not so. But regardless, conservative Victor Davis Hansen is using the tweets as proof of a criminal mindset. However, the offending tweet is actually a Little Wayne quote. So if quoting Little Wayne is a criminal activity, how many white suburban teenagers should be locked up now? Yeah, well, they're also the majority of Little Wayne's listeners, right? Hip hop is mostly listened to um, by young white males. But that aside, there's been other attempts, really egregious things, posting photos uh, on online that are said to be Trayvon Martin that aren't even him, and really trying to, as one of our writers at the Griots wrote today, thugify him and to take away the sympathetic portrait of him. Now, to what end would that be? We've seen this before. Um, I lived in New York when Rudy, Rudolph Giuliani was the mayor, and there was a shooting of a guy named Patrick Dorismond who was shot by an undercover officer. And next thing you know, we saw his juvenile 
records. And the idea there being rather than investigate the conduct of the officers or the conduct of Mr. Zimmerman, we'll just smear the victim to make the other person look more sympathetic by comparison. It, it's really ugly, but I think that's where we're going in this case with some on the right. I, I think we would agree with that. Steve, the right's even bringing back some of their other uh, stereotypes. A report in the conservative Daily Caller said the White House only jumped into the fight, quote, following demands by the new Black Panthers and others on the scene. But the impression I got was that the president was extremely reluctant to discuss this matter. And if you look at the president's tenure as president, he has very rarely entered into matters where race has been an issue. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think the new Black Panther Party had anything to do with the statement that Barack Obama gave the other day. I mean, I think what you're getting at there, though, is there's a reality to certain voices on the right. There was sort of a determination made when Barack Obama first came to the national stage a few years ago that we know he's really a black radical. And it really didn't matter what he said or what he did after that. Everything was going to be crammed into some to sort of fit that narrative. We saw that a few weeks ago with this supposedly blockbuster video from Harvard from 20 years ago oh, yes. that some, you know, I think, Breitbart site had been working on for a long time. It's supposed to be, you know, the smoking gun about Obama's secret black radicalism. You know, and you, and you see that again when, when you see a story like that. The reality is, and Obama sort of learned this, you know, it does not take much to set these guys off. When he weighed in on the Henry Louis Gates thing a couple years ago, the, the you know, arrest by the Cambridge police, um, he really paid a severe price in the court of public opinion. I think, you know, probably regrettably, but I think that reflected itself in the in the delay it took to, to say anything about this and, and, you know, weighing in, I think, in a very, very sort of um, mute way in a lot of regards. Indeed. We'll have more yeah. on the Trayvon Martin case later, but for now, thank you so much. Joanne Reed down in Florida, Karen Finney in yeah. DC, and Steve Konacki here in New York. Coming up, the day's top lines.